So what we're looking at today is criminal damage, which can be found under the Criminal Damage Act 1971. No excuses for, for forgetting the name of that statute. So it's split up into three broad offences. Um, you've got the basic offence, um, you've got the aggravated offence, which has got the, the addition of um, endangering life, and then you have arson, which is essentially the basic offence which is committed by fire. So let's start off by looking at the basic offence, which can be found under Section 11 of the Act. Section 11 defines basic criminal damage as without lawful excuse, destroys or damages property belonging to another, intending to destroy or damage such property, or being reckless as to whether such property would be damaged or destroyed. So let's split that down into the actus reus. So first of all, you have destroying or damaging property, and it's got to belong to another. That's important. For the basic offence, it can't be your own property. Um, so the mens rea is either intending to destroy or damage such property or being reckless as to whether such property would be destroyed or damaged. So intentionally or recklessly destroying or damaging property belonging to another. And you have to do so without a lawful excuse. Lawful excuse is essentially a defence rather than part of the actus reus or mens rea. And it applies where somebody has damaged property for what they believe is a good reason. But we will come on in a bit to have a look at how that works. So the basic offence, once again, is, um, is defined here. You do need to know this and you do need to know it accurately because it contains all of the ingredients for the offence. So yes, you do need to know exactly what it says and not just paraphrase. So let's have a look at property. Um, this is a concept that comes up a lot in property offences for fairly obvious reasons. Um, but it's got to be property of a tangible nature, whether real, personal, and it can include money. It can include wild creatures that have been tamed, but not included uh, wild mushrooms, wild land, wild flowers, fruit, or foliage of a plant grown wild on any land. In all honesty, that's not something that's going to come up in your um, questions in the exam. But if you went into practice, that could be something that you'd need to know. So what's the difference between property for criminal damage and property for the Theft Act? So land subject to exceptions can't be stolen. Um, however, you can damage land for the purposes of criminal damage and intangible property. So things like the apps on a mobile phone could theoretically be stolen, but you couldn't um, commit criminal damage towards them. So let's have a look at some case law. First of all, the case of Cox and Riley, uh, 1986. In this case, um, the appellant damaged the plastic circuit card, which operated a saw by erasing the program from it. So you can see the picture down there, something like that. The court decided that the printed card was property within Section 10.1 of the Act and therefore it was tangible. So if your defendant uh, damages something of an intangible nature, they wipe the contents off your mobile phone or off your laptop, the court will probably interpret that um, in conjunction with this case and say, well, let's consider the tangible item. Um, in order to make it criminal damage. So there's got to be actual damage or destruction. Um, it's got to be some physical harm or impairment or deterioration which can be perceived by the senses um, and the damage can be temporary or permanent um, and it's got to affect its value or usefulness of the property. So let's have a look at some cases. Uh, Samuel and Stubbs is quite a famous one about a policeman's helmet which had been jumped on and temporarily knocked out of shape. And this was deemed to be criminal damage. In Hardman and the Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset Police, the defendant had painted human silhouettes on a pavement using whitewa whitewash, which is actually water-soluble. So it was going to wash off when it rained. 
and the local authority had cleaned the pavements with high pressure water jets, even though the rainwater would have washed it away. And the court said this was sufficient for criminal damage. Each of these cases demonstrate that some effort would be required to rectify the damage. Even in Salmon and Stubbs, though, uh, the helmet could just be knocked back into shape. That was still sufficient to be criminal damage. Um, Morphis and Salmon. In this case, a scaffolding pole, and if you're not familiar, I've included a picture, um, was used to block an access road. And it was said that the scratch on the metal scaffolding bar couldn't amount to criminal damage because it didn't reduce its value or usefulness. Because it was a sort of functional item, that didn't reduce its usefulness. However, the removal of the scaffolding bar impaired the usefulness of the roadblock, and that would amount to criminal damage. What you see here is an indication of the courts wanting to do the right thing essentially so they may be distorting the law a little bit for their own purposes in order to do that so moving on to the mens rea it's either intention or recklessness so for mens rea it must be we need to prove the intention um, so the defendant must be proven to have had intended not only the act which caused the damage but also the damage itself so he will have to have the necessary intention where the damage of another person's property is his purpose or where he foresees it as an inevitable consequence. Sounds a bit complicated, but we'll have a look at a case to illustrate. So if we look at the case of Aaron Smith, um, when a tenant's um, tenancy agreement ended, the defendant decided to rip out wiring which he had installed himself, not realising that by installing it in the property that you're renting, it actually belongs to the landlord. Sort of a little technicality with property law there. Um, he was convicted and the trial judge ruled that he had no lawful excuse to rip out this wiring. He appealed against his conviction and it was upheld on the grounds that an honest but mistaken belief that the property was his own justified his actions. So you can also uh, be reckless with the mens rea, so it's intentional or recklessness. And we have to, the defendant will have to be proven that he had sufficient mens rea for the offence of criminal damage if he's cunning and recklessness. So he has to see a risk and take it anyway. And this is illustrated in R. and Stevenson. Um, in this case, um, a homeless person sheltered in a hollow in a haystack and he lit a fire for warmth. It's pretty obvious what's going to happen next. Um, he was also a schizophrenic. And on his on appeal, his conviction for criminal damage was quashed, um, as he was not cunning and recklessness. He saw no risk by lighting this fire. Because of his mental health condition, he perceived no risk of doing this course of action. Um, Gemmell and Richards also illustrates this point. Um, this was about two young boys uh, 12 and 13, they started a fire and they didn't realise that it was going to spread. Um, it did spread and the trial judge directed the jury to find the boys guilty if the risk of the buildings catching fire would have been obvious to the ordinary and reasonable adult bystander. And that was the important part. They were compa compared with adults. And on, on appeal, the House of Lords decided that the test of recklessness is subjective here. So the defendant needed to appreciate the risk. The boys had failed to appreciate it and therefore their convictions were overturned. So as we talked about earlier, there is a defence available if you had a lawful excuse. And um, the defence of lawful excuse is only available if you believe that the owner would have consented to your actions or if you believe that the damage was required to protect your own property. So let's have a look at some cases. Um, a lawful excuse can be found in section 5.2 of the Act. And if we look first uh, at the honest belief that the person with the rights to the property would consent to it. Um, first of all, the case of Denton. The defendant carried out the actions 
because he believed that his employer would consent to the damage in order to claim on the insurance. Um, and in Jaggard and Dickinson, um, the defendant believed her friend would consent to the damage and an intoxicated belief may be honestly held. You can look up the specific facts of those two. On the other hand, uh, there can also be an honest belief that the property was in immediate need of protection. So in this is illustrated in the case of Hunt. Um, it was further illustrated again um, 10 years later in the case of Hill. In this case, the defendant lived uh, very close by to a US Navy ba base. And in an attempt to persuade the US to remove the base, um, they put up fences to try and um, avoid Russian attacks, which is what they were worried about. So they put up these huge great fences. And the court held that the property was not in immediate need of protection, so she wasn't allowed to use the defence here. So have a think about section 5.2 and think about whether you think um, that any of these scenarios would fall under those exceptions. So what about damaging genetically modified crops in order to protect other crops? How about damaging a burning building to protect neighbouring property? And what about damaging a tree to protect other trees from disease? So you'd have to have a think about how the law applies there. So just a summary of the basic offence. These are the ingredients that you require. So the defendant destroys or damages property belonging to another without lawful excuse, with intention or recklessness, to destroy or damage property belonging to another. So that's the basic offence. So this is a real life example about a 23 year old student who wrote the phrase, liberty, the right to question it, the right to ask, are we free? In playground chalk on the pavement. That's all he wrote. And he was charged with criminal damage. I want you to have a think about whether that was the correct charge. Um, playground chalk is what you can see in his hand there. And it washes away with the rain. Or if you scrubbed it, it would wash away straight away. So have a think, is that criminal damage? So now we need to have a look at the aggravated offence. You can see there um, an example of the aggravated criminal damage. What we're looking at is actions which endanger life. Quite clearly, that young man um, putting what looks like a piece of wood through the front window of a vehicle would endanger life if somebody then tried to get in and drive the vehicle. So aggravated criminal damage is can be found under section 1-2 of the Act and it provides that a person who without lawful excuse destroys or damages any property whether belonging to himself or another intending to destroy or damage any property or being reckless as to whether any property would be destroyed or damaged and intending by the destruction or damage to endanger the life of another or being reckless as to whether the life of another would thereby be endangered shall be guilty of the offence. So what we're looking at, um, basic criminal damage with an add-on essentially, you've still got the destruction or damage of the property but this time it could in theory belong to the defendant, it doesn't have to and they have to intend or be reckless as to destroying or damaging the property and intend or be reckless as to endangering the life of another. So let's have a look at some case law to illustrate this. First off, we've got R and Steer. Uh, in this particular case, the defendant fired a rifle at the bedroom window of his business partner's house. And at the time, the bedroom was actually occupied. He pled guilty to a charge under section 1-1, the basic offence, and following the ruling by the trial judge to a charge of section 1-2, the aggravated offence. He now appealed on the ground that his act, rather than criminal damage to the window, had endangered life. And this was accepted. The danger to life had to result from the damage to the property 
and not from the act which caused the damage. So although firing a gun at somebody is 